You hear all the bull about diet and exercise. Carbs are evil. Do more cardio. Never eat bread or cookies again. Just do a juice cleanse. We get it. We fell for all of the BS too. It's time to go right to the source with the truth about how to live a healthy, sustainable lifestyle. I am Liz. And I'm Becca. We are your nutrition educators, and this is The Food Code. Happy Wednesday. Here Back we with are. another Q&A. I actually really like these because... I mean, a lot of them I know information on, but they make Liz and I kind of like dive a little bit deeper, find yeah. a little bit more research around them. Um, and so I like them because you guys are helping Liz and I continue to learn more and more. Yeah. Very specific <laughs> questions. Yeah, today. they are. So we, uh, we've had a day today. Let's just put it that way. It's found out that we... I'm not going to be angry, but I'm, I'm very sad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So we're in the middle of creating a new six month program that we're going to be launching here shortly. And we were super excited because we had done six weeks recording and we recorded over those videos. It's fine. So it's, it's okay. It's, a, it's okay. When I, my reaction is I just put my head down. On the said, table. I'm going to start drinking wine soon. Yes, <laughs> I did. And I really meant it. But oh. then I was like, oh, we have so many other things to do. So I know. Anyways, I know that some of you out there think that uh, Becca and I have it all together. We live perfect <laughs> lives. We're never tempted by anything. But we're here to tell you, man, we ride the struggle bus some days. Um, oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Some of the things that, you know, we talk about just like in our private conversations, they're hysterical, but they're very, very real and raw. And so <sighs> just know that you, your struggles... Uh, we, we struggle with you. My child smeared poop on his face <laughs> last night, apparently. Uh, when we were doing the Wednesday Night Live, Nick afterwards goes, something happened and I don't want to fi- I don't know if I want to tell you. <laughs> Carson smeared poop on his face. He's learning to potty train. It's obviously going super well with, with the poop aspect. <laughs> I'm actually dreading the day that Marcus poops in the bathtub because I've seen so oh, many people. Oh, it's happened a couple times. Yeah. It actually hasn't happened, hasn't happened that much. And like, I'll be honest, I know people that have gone into their children's bedrooms and like there's poop oh. smeared all over the walls. It's mm-hmm. They've eaten it probably. So like, I think this was a very minimal incident. Um, we had one of those. Poop was all over the floor. Yeah. All over the... Because they take their diaper off when and they do it. He didn't take his diaper off. That's why I was like super confused. Like, And they were like small little pebbles and then it was like all in the blanket all over and i was like oh man i know like how do you sanitize anyways all right no more poop talk on to q a for wednesday (laughs) um we have two really good questions we might get to three today we're going to see how long they take um but these two might take a little bit longer and i think that they're going to help everyone understand a little bit more um so let's dive in so number one um we're going to pair two questions into one because these were both from the same girl um and they're kind of are like getting at the same thing um so she asked should i cap my calories slash macros per meal and are there a certain amount of calories and macros that you can absorb like in a meal and in a day basically Mm -hmm. um so As always, guys, pretty much every question we're going to answer with, it depends. This one depends on a lot. This Mm -hmm. depends on how much you weigh, how much you train, what type of training you're doing, how much lean body mass you have, um, you know, (laughs) what your blood sugar stabilization situation is like, like how you respond to carbs and fats. So we're going to give you a little bit of research. Most of the research is around protein, um, not as much on carbohydrates and fats. Um, there's not a, cause just because those vary so much more um, when it comes to like how much you're actually going to be absorbing. So um, we'll get to carbohydrates and fats in just a second and like what those depend on. But we want to start with protein first. Yep. And this is something that was really, I mean, it's interesting in the research. I was um, researching this the other day. And again, again, as Becca was saying, like we know in general, like you know, some of the things just from all of the courses that we've taken, but what does the research say? So per meal, how does the body utilize, break down, digest and absorb protein? And what implications does that have in terms of like how you ingest it throughout the day? 
say. So the majority of the data kind of indicates that, you know, while you can consume protein of, let's say, 20 grams or greater, it results in greater amino acid oxidation, but it's not the fate for all of the in additional ingested amino acids, as mm -hmm. some of them are utilized for tissue building um, purposes. So based upon the current evidence, um, this study that I was uh, reading, and I, we can link it in the show notes, but it concluded that to maximize anabolism, which is where we want to be, we always want to be in an anabolic state. So we are not catabolizing our muscle. Um, we're actually supporting the muscle mass and building muscle. You should consume a protein target of about 0.2 grams per pound per meal across the minimum of four meals in order to reach a minimum of 0.78 grams per pound of your body weight per day. So here's an example. If you're a 150 pound woman and you take 0.78, 150 times 0.78, you would get 120. Okay. So you want to consume 120 grams of protein throughout the day. So if we're taking this across four meals, as in the study did, you would be consuming about 30 grams per day. Now that's the minimum. Okay. So then there's an upper daily intake of and this is in a lot of different research studies. Some people say one gram per pound per day. Other studies have researched all the way up to 1.4 grams per yeah. pound, and it's been safe. So yeah. if you took that, right, and you did the one gram per pound per day, you would get your number and you'd divide it by four. And here's where I think for larger individuals, you might want to divide it by five or six or stay closer to that minimum threshold. Because yeah. oftentimes when we're setting protein intake goals, yes, we do look at your body weight, but if someone is 250, 300 pounds, we're going to kind of change that a bit and go more off of kind of your goal weight because you can't be consuming 250, 300 grams of protein per day. Yeah, I mean, you can. You're just not going to probably utilize it the best. And remember, we're talking about how to maximize anabolism. So anabolism is essentially like the maintenance and growth of your muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. And so most of these research studies, right, you know, understandably so, have been developed around people that train and want to build muscle mass. And so they do studies to try to see what's like the sweet spot for getting to this maximal, you know, anabolism situation. Um, and this will vary for females and males as well so just remember that because that this is not like there's plenty of people out there that eat less protein than this and there's plenty of people out there that maybe eat more protein than this mm -hmm. but this is for maximizing that so we want to talk about like how you actually digest food which i think is important to understand to understand how the the per sitting situation gets adjusted so when you consume food it passes through the stomach and into the intestines before it gets absorbed by the body and the process of muscle contractions that basically push the food from the esophagus down into the stomach and into the intestines is called peristalsis, okay? Its speed can vary. And there's some things that uh, impact this, like stress on the system, time in between meals, types of food. Like there's a lot of things that can impact this. Food ingested basically loses its form though in the acid bath that happens in your stomach. And it turns into basically like indistinguishable mass that's known as chyme. And then chyme is pushed through the intestines and the outer layer gets eaten up by the walls of the intestine into the body, okay? So this is how we get nutrients into the bloodstream and into cells. And this is the process of nutrient absorption that happens within the body. So basically, there may not be much of a difference between your breakfast and your morning snack kind of getting into the same spaces at once. Um, and that's why we, a lot of times we have, like if people struggle with going to the bathroom, we have them actually put more time in between meals because it allows this motility, this pushing of food down through the system and digestion mm -hmm. to happen better, okay? And the rate of uptake on protein on protein an hourly basis fluctuates between five to ten grams per hour depending on the source okay so how much is actually getting absorbed into and like uptaken into the body is only about five to ten grams per hour okay so can you eat too much at once it kind of depends because your body's going to adjust okay mm -hmm. so amino acids and some peptides are actually able to like self-regulate their time in the intestines um, an example of this is a digester hormone known as cck and in addition to regulating appetite and satiety response it can also slow down intestinal contractions okay and it kind of like 
it, it can either speed up or slow down in response to the amount of protein that's consumed. And so the CCK hormone is released when dietary protein is present, and it kind of demonstrates in a way in which the body can slow digestion down in order to absorb all of that present protein. Okay, so it kind of depends on your body and what it's used to, and it can upregulate and downregulate these things to essentially account for more or less. Yep. If that makes sense. Yeah, because I think, you know, unless you're really tracking every gram that goes into your mouth, you are going to vary day to day and totally. meal to meal. You know, even if you're building well rounded meals, that meal isn't going to be perfect every single day for lunch with 30 grams of protein, unless you are weighing things out and being very strict, right? Mm. But, you know, we know a lot of people aren't necessarily doing that. They might, um, you know, be just looking at their total day, right? Are yep. they meeting their goals throughout the day? And, you know, Becca and I have talked about this before in terms of blood sugar kind of depends upon how you feel after meals. Like, do you feel like you get energized and you eat every two to three hours and you feel comfortable with that? Or you get tired after certain meals and so therefore you like to eat less frequently. Everybody is going to be different. So let's talk a little bit about carbs and fats because that was, you know, bucketed into this question. So again, it depends. It depends upon what your goals are, how well you know, you're know you recovering. So if you're someone who's training, we always recommend to time your you know carbohydrates post-workout um, and then again at dinner time. So let's say you're an early morning person um, in the gym, then you want to have a good post-workout meal. We usually say here, general rule of thumb, two to one carb protein ratio, upper of three to one ratio there, depending upon how intense your training is. Then we have to look at blood sugar stabilization, right? Um, and how uh, you feel after meals. Again, are you getting tired or are you getting energy from these meals? For some individuals, they find that they tend to do better doing a little bit lower carb, higher fat, um, you know, when they're not training, maybe rest days or just, you know, active recovery days or in the early morning hours of the day. We usually always recommend, and we talk about this in our um, fat loss course, we always recommend having some sort of good carbohydrate with dinner to bring down cortisol and support sleep. Um, here's the caveat, right? We don't know this person's situation or how they metabolize food because we also have to take into account insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. And that would change, you know, for certain individuals. So, some people can take 100 grams of carbs in at a meal and be totally fine. You know, I was actually talking with our mentor a few weeks ago about this is like some people will blend a ton of nutrients into a morning smoothie and you can drink it and you can tolerate it because you've blended all those nutrients. You've already done a lot of the breakdown. So mm -hmm. your digestive system basically just soaks it up and you don't feel, you know, like you're stuffed for the next two or three hours, yeah. even though there was 800 calories in that smoothie, the way that you would if you sat down and you tried to eat a plate of chicken, rice, vegetables, avocado in 800 calories, you know, so yeah. it's all going to be kind of dependent upon how, you know, you're ingesting the food and what the food quality is. And then, you know, also how you feel afterwards. So some people don't feel super great eating, let's say more than 30, 40, 50 grams in a sitting because they feel like carbohydrates make them tired. Mm -hmm. A lot of times with people we see too, high carb, high fat makes them tired. So it's all dependent upon how you feel. But the biggest thing that we want to kind of wrap this question up with is talking about how you absorb your nutrients. Yeah, absolutely. So the nutrient absorption rate varies for people from like 10% of the food that you eat gets absorbed to like 90%. And so this has a lot to do with how healthy the gut is, the stress levels in the body, what types of food obviously you're eating. But things, for example, like SIBO, leaky gut, low stomach acid, GERD, acid reflux, like stress, all of these things impair your nutrient absorption. Okay. So examples of like not getting stuff from your food. So chronic, chronic inflammation in the body, just as one example, increases the degradation of, and the need for vitamin six actually goes up. So like you, because you have chronic inflammation in the body, your needs for certain vitamins get higher. And then another example is like if you have a higher body fat level and inflammation, you're actually less able to absorb vitamin D, which is a fat soluble vitamin because it kind of gets like stuck for a lack of better words in your fat cells mm -hmm. um, because it's fat soluble. So it gets kind of absorbed into those cells and then it's not utilized by the body very well. So there's a lot of factors in terms of gut health, in terms of overall physical health, BMI, you know, body fat percentage that has to do with how you're actually getting your food and absorbing it. Um, so we need to understand that there's 
there's a lot of moving parts to this question. Mm-hmm. Um, what I would summarize this with is number one, it obviously depends on your goals. Depends on are they performance based goals? Are they purely body compositional goals? Um, to understand a little bit more on like how I would time things. Um, it depends on training style and frequency. Are you doing mainly cardio? Are you sedentary? Are you weight training? Um, it depends on other symptoms like we were talking about, gut health, you know, overall energy throughout the day, how your sleep is. It depends on types of food. Like you're going to process and break down a donut a lot faster than you're going to process and break down like a sweet potato and some chicken. And so you're probably going to feel hungrier faster. You're not going to feel as full. Like we've talked about before, there's research studies that basically show eating chips. Your body doesn't even almost register the calories that you're eating because they're so light. They're so airy. It's not even like an acknowledgement for the body that those are being consumed. And so you're not going to be full from them. And so it depends on what types of food, but what I would say bottom line for like advice for this things to utilize nutrient timing around your workouts, I would put, you know, obviously higher carbs around your workouts at dinner time, like Liz was talking about, and then spread protein evenly throughout the day. And for most females, I would say, honestly, one gram per pound of body weight, it's like the Northern limit I would go. Um, yeah. Most people don't need to be doing much more than that. No, hundred percent. And I think that's, if you're an athlete, you know, totally. and you're really training for something, you're really doing um, some intense uh, strength training. So yeah. let's go on to question number two. So this uh, was a question that Becca got, um, and it was asking about kind of like set points, body weight set points, um, and what to do when your doctor says that you've reached homeostasis but you are still overweight and unhappy. So a couple of things here. Uh, This is a very broad, loaded question and a a bit hard to answer without knowing more. Um, Here's the thing that I would kind of challenge this question with, right? Did they dig into anything else with you? What stats do they have to tell you that you've reached homeostasis? Um, Did you see a nutritionist or an RD afterwards? Um, Did you see a weight loss clinic or bariatric um, doctor? Did they evaluate your food? Most of the time we talk with people and they're nutritionists, um, doctors, registered dietitians in most cases have not evaluated their food. I'm not making you know a dig there at all i'm just saying like this is what we've heard um is that you know they've been given kind of a plan and said here's your calorie goal here's what we would recommend Mm -hmm. but they're not reading through your my fitness pal they're not helping you perfect blood sugar balance they're not looking at you know quality of your food or triggers emotional eating stress eating things like that what the balance of those meals are as we just talked about in the last question um and then what about your exercise uh routine and then even further than that do you have any autoimmune conditions do you have any gut health issues do you have any history of type 2 diabetes in your family or you know are you early type 2 diabetes pre-diabetic um what else is going on? Like, do we have thyroid issues? Um, what is your diet history? How long have you been trying to lose weight? Because a lot of times what we see is the chronic dieter who has tried to cut calories to a very low place and overtrain, and they basically just run their body into the ground. And this is where they experience metabolic adaptation. So I think it's very unfair for them to tell you that you've reached homeostasis when we're not looking at all the other factors, the length of a deficit, the um, depth of that deficit and what your exercise is. Because in this scenario, if you have been dieting for a really long time and you've got to a place that you are adapted metabolically, then you have to reverse out of that. We have to balance hormones. We have to dig deep to some other root cause issues, manage stress, sleep, so on. And it's possible for you to lose weight. I promise. We have women that come to us all the time who have been, you know, battling resistant weight loss or like weight loss resistance, um, stubborn weight. And most of the time we have to go through a healing phase and then we are able to earn the right to get the fat off. But we'll talk a little bit about body weight set points because I think that's kind of the main purpose of this question. I just wanted to caveat that there because I think if you're saying that you're overweight and you're unhappy, there's so many other things that we have to look at with you as the individual. Yeah, absolutely. So here's a couple things. I I did like talk just briefly back and forth with her. Basically her doctor said your body's reached a set point and you should just learn to be happy here. I I don't know if those were his exact words. I really hope not. Um, But what is a body weight set point? So the body has a system for maintaining a level of fat that's like appropriate for the human ecological niche 
niche essentially. And this is called the energy homeostasis system or like the homeostatic regulation of weight. And it's a system that's one of the main reasons why weight loss is so hard to keep off once you lose it. Because this homeostatic system responds to basically any reduction in fat in the body. So for example, if you lose 20 pounds, the homeostatic system basically increases hunger. It decreases your resting energy expenditure. So how many calories you burn in a day. So even when you're just sitting down, the number of calories that you're burning is lower and it extracts more calories from the food that you eat. So your metabolic efficiency goes up. Okay. So it has all these mechanisms that are basically working against you when you lose weight to get you back to the body fat set point or what it thinks is the ideal weight for you. Okay. So there's a number of factors that kind of dysregulate this set point. It depends on a lot of things. First, genetics plays a role. Um, Gene mutations, single gene mutations, these are kind of minor. Um, And then we have like the epigenetic and the developmental factors. Okay, so these things are our environment. Okay, this is like, you know, what you are exposed to in terms of bacteria. It can also um, be like your birth, your situation. So like where you birthed vaginally, your, you know, maternal weight, maternal status of the mother, um, exposure when you were birthed, gut flora, breastfeeding, all those kinds of things. And then obviously later in life, it comes down to what we expose ourselves to food, environmental toxins, lifestyle, stress, sedentary lifestyle, stuff like that. The problem with obesity is that the set point becomes too high. And so the weight that the body is defending is like inappropriate. Okay. And, it, and that's again, of course, why weight loss becomes so difficult for people. And we need to kind of dive into what increases this set point. Okay. So number one, inflammation. Yeah. Oh my gosh. If I had a dollar for every, every time, time we said inflammation and I hate saying inflammation because it's such a broad term and mm-hmm. like Inflammation is basically something is not right in the body. Your body is creating a systemic response to it to try to fight whatever is not going on. Most often it is due to some type of gut disorder, leaky gut, dysbiosis. Something is getting into the system that's not supposed to be in the system. Yeah, but there are many other things that can cause inflammation. Totally. You know, we have to think about acute inflammation and chronic inflammation as well. Yep. Um, this can be highly processed foods and a lot of the chemicals and additives that are in our foods that can cause inflammation. Those are foreign objects to the body, right? I can guarantee mm-hmm. you cavemen were not uh, chowing down on McDonald's and Pringles, you know, back in the day. So those are foreign things Uh, to the body when we ingest them. The second thing here is whether or not you have a known gut issue, you can have food sensitivities that are causing kind of this chronic underlying inflammation and you keep ingesting those things because you don't know that it's causing that issue just yet. Um, Maybe it's, you know, something that you eat rarely and you don't have that big of a reaction um, the way you would like an allergic reaction. And so you consume it and your immune system has to kick into gear and there's an inflammatory response, but you don't necessarily tie the two together because there's other things that can also like be causing these things. So that's, that's one thing from the food side. Then we look at environmental toxins, right? So BPAs, plastics, chemicals, parabens, all those things, whether it's sprayed into um, or sprayed onto our foods, like our our, our vegetables and our fruits, and then we're ingesting that. Um, obviously, grains, all of those things, uh, meat, the hormones that are being pumped into non-organic uh, meat and then being stored as fat. Now you're ingesting those things. Um, it can also be your skincare, your hair care. All of those have you know high levels of toxins that again are foreign to the body. Okay, then we have to look at micronutrient deficiencies. And I think this is a big one because a lot mm-hmm. of people just having, I was just having a conversation with one of our um, clients earlier today. And she's in her, I believe, uh, late 50s, early 60s. And we were talking about micronutrients and nutrient availability to the body, vitamins and minerals. Like, are we actually getting those from our food? Number one, like, are we eating quality food? And two, are we actually absorbing what we're eating? Um, Or is there an issue that we are not breaking down, digesting and absorbing those nutrients properly? And so we have a lot of vitamin mineral deficiencies in the body. And therefore we start to see other things. You know, a lot of people say like, I'm just, I crave sugar all the time. I crave salt all the time. Well, cravings are malnourishment. It's like we are unnourished Mm -hmm. with micronutrients. So what can help with that? We always recommend a high quality digestive enzyme. We like ones that have HCL in them because stomach acid 
is very, very important. Stomach acid, as Becca was kind of talking about earlier in the last question with chime, this is like the acid bath that helps your body break down the food and be able to actually pull nutrients from food into your cells. Yep. So through that small intestinal um, lining and you know the gut lining as well. So that's a big one. Um, then we think about, as I kind of mentioned before, availability of highly palatable energy dense food yep so right. this is talking about like the hedonic versus homeostatic for prehistoric nature so like liz and i talk about this a lot we are prehistoric in nature mm -hmm. we are we have not had a reboot of our bodies since prehistoric times we are the same types but we've been placed in this world where things are a lot different stress is a lot different types of foods are a lot different availability of food is a lot different so the homeostatic like i was talking about is basically meant to keep people from getting too lean so like this is why females lose their cycle this is why hunger tends to drive up cravings tend to drive up if someone gets too lean this is like the famine it's protecting you from famine it also tries to protect from getting too overweight because in that time it was dangerous to be overweight because then you're not able to survive and fight for food but this hedonistic built-in mindset is kind of becoming a problem in common times because back in the day, those prehistoric times, that would allow us to, we have this mindset ingrained because it allowed us to search out highly palatable foods in those times. That was because dense foods were safe. They were calorie dense. They would allow you to get fat onto your body when you might not be able to get food for a long period of time in prehistoric sense. So the problem now, we have a grocery store at the corner of every street and everything is chemically processed to basically be addictive in nature. And so this is where this problem comes into play and why it's created this new set point issue for a lot of people with body weight because you're basically addicted to food and it's it's very hard to break that so i want to give an example that they've done research and this was particularly like a research study done on rats rats are very similar to humans that humans that's why they they study rats in terms of like epidemiology and food studies so these rats were given rat chow and they were also given human junk food Okay, the rats basically only ate the junk food, even when both were available. They developed obesity, those that were genetically predisposed to that. They developed obesity and then they implemented physical like pain things. So I wouldn't say torture, but they basically like would shock the rats and they would have to go through these shocks to get to the junk food when the rat chow was available without the physical pain circumstance. So these rats were literally going through physical pain just to get to the junk food, even though the rat chow was freely available. So it becomes like we are, we have this drive within us that force like almost forces us to go towards these highly palatable foods so it's it's kind of creating us within this like uh, uphill almost seemingly unbeatable battle. battle and so the only thing that's truly within research shown to change the set point in terms of like satiation levels hunger all these things is bariatric surgery it impacts the satiety levels of humans and so there's been some preliminary research that's also shown like a Mediterranean style diet, paleo style diet, which Liz and I are very strong believers in. Like yep. what do these two diets have in common? They're whole unprocessed foods that are well balanced between proteins, between fats, between carbohydrates. And they, they allow for satiation without overconsumption. Yep. And when you remove those highly palatable foods, you're a lot less likely to continue to crave them. Yeah. But some, this is where with some clients, like we see that abstaining from certain things is necessary because there's no moderating it. It's like a, a flip, uh, a, sorry, a switch that flips on, yep. you know, when they get a taste of those things and it's like, oh, give me all the cookies or give me all the chips, you know? Um, and so I think that we can kind of summarize this here and I don't think, you know, you are stuck forever. I do think there's other things that we can definitely do and implement. Um, there's a, a lot of questions that, you know, we mm -hmm. would want to ask and dive into, but if you want to start on your own, here's where we would start. Introduce one ingredient, whole foods for at least 90, 95% of your diet. Um, fruits, vegetables, lean protein sources, healthy fats. A lot of women are afraid of fats. We need fats for hormonal production. Um, the other thing in terms of like satiety is protein, as we talked about in the last uh, question as well, protein takes a long time to break down, digest in the body. So it's going to keep you satisfied and satiated. You mm -hmm. might do better on a higher protein, higher fat diet, and a little bit lower carb. Um, higher fats too will help keep you fuller um, longer. Yeah. Push water 
right? Lots of water, I would say half of your um, body weight, but also consider adding, you know, different um, trace minerals, electrolytes, yep. things that are helping your body not flush out too and much. Dilute. A lot of people overhydrate mm-hmm. um, movement. Yeah, absolutely. The bottom line here, guys, is the reason that a lot of times set points become a thing is because your body has inherent mechanisms to protect you against losing body fat, Mm -hmm. which has become distorted over time. This is not to say that you cannot lose body fat and keep it off. A lot of it is being able to find the right combination of foods that work for you, the right lifestyle that is right for you, removing triggers, periodizing your nutrition and intake so that you're not constantly in a calorie deficit and you're giving your body refeeds. And so there's, always ways around this. This is not something that like your body set point is 200 pounds. You're never going to get below 200 pounds. No, you can easily probably get below 200 pounds. It's what things are ingrained that need to be broken down, peeled the layers back and really changed in terms of habits and routines and mindset probably for a lot of people Mm -hmm. to be able to keep this weight off. Are there certain weights for people that are kind of just like happy places, healthy places. Yeah, absolutely. That getting below those, the body's going to fight you for sure. But I don't think that this is saying at all that someone that's 250 or 300 pounds in an unhealthy place can't get below that weight and keep it off. It's just, there are a lot of things that are ingrained within the body that are ingrained within the mind that need to be addressed and that probably need to be worked with someone on because this stuff is hard to do on your own. Yep. So hopefully these questions have been helpful. Um, It is, you know, we love answering these for you guys. Hopefully you guys find a lot of value in them. And if you have questions that you want answered, submit them info at fitmomlife.com. You can also message Liz or I on Facebook or Instagram. We would be happy to address those questions. We have a couple more questions I know on the docket um, that we're doing a little bit more digging around that will be coming up. Um, But if you guys like these, we'll we'll be continuing to sprinkle them in um, and hope you guys have a great hump day. We'll see you on Friday. Thank you all so much for being here. If you've enjoyed this podcast, the best thing that you could do for us as a gift to us would be to take a screenshot and share it on Instagram, tag us, share it on Facebook, whatever platform that you listen, or just tell a friend, invite a friend to listen to this podcast. Um, The more that you can kind of share with word of mouth, the more people that we can touch throughout the world. Five-star reading and review on iTunes as this helps us grow and reach others. So if you have any questions, feel free to shoot us a DM or an email and we will talk to you soon. Have a great day. Thank you.